light emitting silicon. How a new technology changes the future of data transmission. Eric Backers, University of Eindhoven. On November the 9th, 1989, I heard the news while at school from one of the teachers. We spent the whole evening watching television. And Elham Fadali, University of Eindhoven. On November the 9th, 1989, I wasn't born yet. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm, I'm Eric Bakkers. I'm a researcher at the Eindhoven University of Technology. And together with uh, Elon Fadali, a former PhD student in our group, we will present our uh, project, which is entitled Light Emission from Silicon. On the photo you see here behind me, you see the inside of a data center. And we are using these data centers to uh, downstream movies, to do data searches, to uh, upload our uh, photos and to store them, and maybe also for online shopping. And we are all using these data centers, and we are using them more and more. That's all fine, but these data centers, they consume a lot of energy. And on this next photo, you can see what is happening in the basement of such a data center. So this is the, the cooling installation. Because most of the energy which is used by these data centers is actually dissipated in the form of heat. And from this photo, I think you can get a feeling of how much energy is actually uh, dissipated and is used. It's, it's an awful amount of energy. And it is extrapolated that in 2030, so let's say in, in uh, 10 years from now, that these data centers will use like 20% of our global energy supply. 20%. So that's an awful amount of energy. So why is that, you can ask yourself. So if we zoom in, so we go back to this data center, so the upper floors, there we have computers, mainframes, and if we zoom in there, then these computers are based on electronic chips. And on this photo, you can see uh, an example of such a chip. And on these chips, we send around signals using electrical currents. And these currents, they suffer from an electrical resistance. And this has two consequences. So first of all, um, due to this resistance, we heat up this chip. And I think we all know that if you use your laptop, uh, your laptop very heavily, that it can become quite hot. Uh, so that's one consequence. And the other consequence is that we cannot make these chips any faster due to this resistance. So already since 20 years, the clock frequency, and that says something about the speed of these uh, chips, is limited to, uh, well, to a certain frequency, which is 4 gigahertz. And we cannot make them faster. And this is fundamentally limited by this resistance. Now, you may ask yourself, why don't we use light, actually, to send around these signals on the chip? Because, well, the whole internet is based on light, so we have bundles of glass fibers connecting the, the continents, worldwide, and maybe, well, our houses are also connected by glass fibers to the internet, and we use laser light uh, to send the information through these uh, glass fibers. And the laser has just been beautifully introduced, so light travels very fast. And, and the two advantages of, laser, of, of light are, first of all, that, they, that light doesn't suffer from this resistance, so we will consume much less energy if we use light instead of electricity. And secondly, we can uh, transmit uh, information much faster, so we can make much faster chips. Let's now go back to the electronic chips that I just explained. So these chips are made from silicon, and silicon is a semiconductor, and in a way it's a beautiful material. Um, well, the whole semiconductor industry is um, um, based on silicon, and it has been very successful. I mean, well, you can find these chips all over the place, in our cell phones, in laptops, and silicon can be made from silicon oxide, which basically is sand, so it's abundant, and therefore it's also relatively cheap. There's one major disadvantage of silicon, and that is that it cannot work with light. It cannot uh, absorb light, but also not emit light efficiently. And that's a major drawback, because that makes it kind of impossible to integrate these um, light-emitting features on the chip and to do this communication on the chip optically. Now, over the years, many, many groups have worked on integrating optical functionality on these silicon chips. And here I have an example of such a silicon chip, a silicon wafer, sorry. So this is a, a piece of silicon uh, from which these, these chips are diced and then made into electronic components. 
And what people nowadays do, or what is the current best solution to integrate these optical signals in silicon, is to use another material, which is called indium phosphide. So that's a different semiconductor in which we can make lasers and detectors, and then pieces of this indium phosphide can be glued onto such a silicon wafer. So this is the current best solution. But indium phosphide is an extremely expensive material compared to silicon. That's one problem, and the other problem is that this, this gluing of the one chip on the other chip is a very difficult process. And it would be so wonderful if we could directly integrate the optical functionality directly in the silicon, as such that we can have this uh, optical information transfer all done within the silicon. So this was the purpose or the goal of our project, so creating light emission from silicon. And when we started this project like 10 years ago, it felt a bit like a man on the moon mission. Because, well, we knew that so many groups, so many companies have tried this, and no one succeeded so far. So this was really a very difficult problem, we knew. But luckily, there was a paper published uh, 50 years ago, in 1972, which predicted that if we would change the crystal structure of the silicon, so that is the way these atoms are stacked in the material, that we could make silicon emit light. And that's exactly what Alan is going to explain to you. Thank you. So, as Eric said, it's all about the uniqueness of the structural, uh, uh, the crystal structure of the materials and the atoms stacking inside it. So now I'm talking about the other side of the story of Professor Strickland and playing with the atoms to get the uh, uh, tune, the properties of the photon emission in light. So let's first think about what is a crystal structure or what's atomic stacking. So. Let's envision atoms as marbles. So if you uh, see here, um, the first layer of uh, a material like these marbles, so we call it layer A, and then the second layer stacks on top of the first layer in the gaps spacing between the atoms of the first layer, and we call it layer B. So now, the third layer can take either one of two positions. The first position can land on top of the spacing uh, uh, of the gaps of the atoms of the second layer, and we call it layer C, but here's a trick. So the spacing of layer C is unique and is different than the uh, gaps where atoms of layer B landed. So now we have three layers, A, B, C, on three different unique places. So B doesn't have a layer around it, C also doesn't have, sorry, doesn't have atoms in the, uh, uh, aligned with the layer underneath it. So the other uh, uh, position that layer three can take, it's the other uh, unique uh, uh, spacing on top of the atoms of layer B. So now we have A, B, A stacking, where the third layer aligned perfectly on top of the first layer. So such a stacking, we call it hexagonal silicon, and this is the interesting material that we want to get light emission out of it. And the first one, it's actually the cubic silicon, uh, which silicon takes in nature, and unfortunately, it cannot emit light efficiently. So. Uh, it seems simple. Why can't we just make hexagonal silicon and get efficient light emission out of it? Here's the bottleneck. The bottleneck is that such a material does not exist in nature. So somehow we, have to, we, we need to force atoms to take such crystal symmetry such that we can emit light uh, out of it. So now let's uh, go a bit broader and think of these atoms as the building blocks. So. What we have done uh, in our research, we took a technique called a template-assisted technique, where we take a, a hexagonal template. So if we start, for example, with such uh, a symmetry of, uh, of the bricks, so this is the template, and then the following layers will follow naturally the first template layer, as you can see here. And then if you want to take a, a, a different symmetry, like this zigzagged shape, then also the f next layers will follow naturally as the uh, first layer. So if you can think now of these bricks as the atoms, so here you can think of it as A, B, C, like the cubic stacking of silicon and the cubic structure, and here A, B, C, like hexagonal silicon. So it looks simple, but it needs a lot of engineering and forcing of these atoms to uh, order in this uh, 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 symmetry by uh, uh, tuning lots of parameters in our labs. So now, how do we go from this macroscopic world of the bricks to our atoms? So what we have done is done, we uh, um, 
fabricated uh, a hexagonal template material in the geometry of nanopillars or nanowires. And you can think of it, they are very tiny structures, almost a thousand times thinner than human hair. And then this unique symmetry of the hexagonal template is transferred to the silicon atoms growing around it, and then we get this uh, hexagonal core shell structure where the shell in blue around it is the silicon atoms in the hexagonal symmetry. So it looks beautiful on the schematic, and now let's see how it looks like in reality. So as I've said, they are very tiny structures. We cannot see it by, our, by eye or even by um, typical optical microscopes. So we looked at it with electron microscopes, and here you can see a scanning electron microscopy images of these structures in real. And uh, on the left here, you can see the very thin hexagonal uh, core templates here, and you can see the scale is already very small nanometer. And then when we uh, uh, um, force the silicon atoms to take the symmetry of the hexagonal core here, you can see these beautiful hexagonal uh, facets taking the same symmetry of the core, and then you can see uh, uh, it's forming these facets of the nanostructures. So it looks working, and the signature is promising. So now let's make sure how the atoms are stacking inside this structure, if it's taking the right symmetry or not. So if we zoom in even further and we look at the atomic stacking, so this is a transmission electron microscope image. On the left here, you can see the atoms stacking in the hexagonal core in blue. And then you can see that they are taking the A, B, A, this zigzag symmetry that we wanted at the beginning. And then, if you look to the uh, right part and in, in, in highlighted in red, you can see that the silicon atoms are following naturally the hexagonal crystal of the blue core. So the key element here is the symmetry of the core. So the core has been enabling of uh, the realization of such beautiful structure. So amazing. Now we have realized uh, this beautiful material and with high quality uh, hexagonal stacking, does it emit light efficiently now? So this is what we have done. We made our optical characterization and the optical measurements in the lab, and we saw very intense, uh, efficient light emission out of this material. So we can say that uh, the wall towards uh, efficient light emission from silicon have fallen finally after nearly five decades. So now we have efficient light emission from this uh, high quality material, then what's next? Next is to make an efficient light source out of it, which we call a laser. And now I'll leave Eric uh, to talk uh, more about applications of such a laser out of silicon. Thank you. So let's take over here. So, so now we have demonstrated efficient light emission, and we even have the first signatures of lasing in this new material. Now the next big challenge that we want to face with our group is to actually come up with a process which is compatible with standard silicon processing. So, so far it has been academic and more like a proof of principle. So then the next big thing is to um, realize this material in a, in a silicon compatible uh, process. Um, I think it's very important because then the silicon industry can take over and can integrate this material in their chips and then these chips may become available at a large scale. Our first application that we have in mind is to uh, do these well, photonic chips such that we can reduce the energy consumption of these data centers, but many more applications will open. And one other application which I would like to mention is, is LIDAR, which stands for uh, light-based radar. So uh, maybe in the near future we can think of these autonomously driving cars. So these are cars without a driver. And what is very important is that these cars have many sensors, such that they, they can detect the, the traffic surrounding them in order to avoid collisions. And once these photonic silicon chips are realized, then also these, these LiDAR chips may become available at a large scale. So these are the walls that we would like to break down. Thank you very much.